Hey, what's up everyone? The new Cubase has arrived, Cubase 12, and today I'm gonna give you 12 reasons why you should upgrade. But first, I think we need to take a bit of a victory lap. Let the joyous news be spread, the wicked old Dongle. witch at last is dead. Ding dong, the dongle's dead. Which old dongle? This old dongle. Ding dong, the Cubase dongle's dead. So yes, Cubase 12 is here and I'm running Cubase 12 Pro, which is what I'll talk about today. And I'm gonna give you 12 reasons why you should upgrade if you're still running Cubase 11. And it'll mostly track the changes between 11 and 12. I think Cubase is a solid DAW if you haven't bought a DAW yet. Um, if you want something that has the kitchen sink, all the features you could possibly need for music production. But today I'm going to focus on 12 reasons why you should upgrade. So let's just start with reason number one. The dongle. For years, Cubase had uh, what they call a USB E licensor. It was a little dongle that you constantly had to have running in your computer uh, in a USB drive for the software to work. Right now, I am running Cubase 12. We can go look at the version. And I'm running it without a dongle. And if I were to install this upstairs on my laptop, I could run it without a dongle as well. In fact, Steinberg will allow you to have Cubase activated on three machines at any given time without a dongle. Now, if you wanted to put it on a fourth machine, you'll just have to deactivate one of the machines and activate a separate machine. It all seems very flexible to me. I don't know what your workflow is, but I max out at two machines that run Cubase. If you are in an environment where you're bouncing back and forth, you may have to do the reactivation deactivation shuffle, but I think that's easier than remembering a piece of hardware all the time and devoting one of your precious few USB ports to dongle life. And that is the big selling point, which is the interesting thing to me, because for the last two years, I've griped about the dongle less than ever because I haven't been going anywhere. I've been stuck here and I've been working almost exclusively on this desktop computer where the dongle fades into the background. But now that the world is opening up, the elimination of USB e-licensing and licensing rather by contacting Steinberg servers uh, on the internet is a welcome, welcome addition to Cubase 12. So far, this only applies to Cubase 12 and Dorico 4, but according to Steinberg, the dongle's not necessarily dead. Steinberg says that the dongle, the e-licensor, will be maintained and run for some time to come, at least until such time as all actively maintained Steinberg products have been transitioned to the new Steinberg licensing system. So what does that mean? Does that mean that old versions will be able to run without an e-licensor? I don't know. All I know is that the only version that you can run right now without an e-licensor is Cubase 12, and that alone is a good enough reason to upgrade. So that's all for today, everyone. Just kidding. Number two. Apple Silicon support. This next reason won't apply to everyone, and it certainly won't apply to me because I use PCs, but if you are planning to use an Apple in the future, you will buy one that has Apple Silicon inside of it. What does that mean? Well, up until a couple of years ago, Apple was based on Intel processors. They'll use an x86 instruction set. Well, a couple of years ago, they transitioned to their M1 chip, which uses an ARM instruction set. And that means that software written for x86 had to be translated to the new Apple Silicon. So previous versions of Cubase went through that process. What does that mean? Well, it's not natively supported. Well, now Cubase 12 is natively supported on Apple Silicon, and that's going to make a huge difference if you want to purchase a MacBook or a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro or an iMac to do your production on. Now, whether this native support for Apple Silicon will outstrip the translation that was being done before remains to be seen. And I'd love to hear from you in the comments if you do have an Apple Silicon MacBook and you're running Cubase to let me know how Cubase 12 does compare to Cubase 11. And I may try to get a MacBook into the studio here just so I can benchmark it for you guys. So get subscribed to the channel and stay tuned for that. But accommodating the new Apple architecture is something that Steinberg had to do because it doesn't look like that's going away anytime soon. So I'm glad to say that they've done it with this version. Number three, new MIDI mapping. In previous versions of Cubase, the MIDI mapping was pretty old school, especially if you were using a generic remote. They've completely updated that and made it totally visual. So I can show you exactly how that works real quick by jumping into Cubase. The new MIDI mapping is in the lower zone and we can see no MIDI controller is connected. I can choose my uh, Akai MPK261, we'll call it MPK261. And I'll just uh, map these knobs and faders here real quick. So if I move forward, all I have to do is start moving these controls and Cubase will see them.
and then we can make these a fader. We can make it bigger if we want and start using these. Cubase will see those. And then of course we can use buttons down here and make those a bit smaller, of course. And then, and now my visual representation of my knobs, faders, and buttons is exactly the same as it is on my MIDI controller. So we can select any parameter here and go to our mapping assistant, choose any parameter we want to control and then move this and apply mapping and voila we have mapped this parameter to that knob i think people will find this ease of mapping extraordinarily useful so i think that the new midi mapping function if it functions perfectly will be a welcome addition to cubase number four audio to chord track this is a new feature I'm pretty stoked about. You can play audio, uh, maybe a guitar or a piano or whatever you're recording, dump it into your chord track and it'll tell you what chords you've just played. Let's try this out. So I got my gu guitar here. I'm gonna play a G major, C major, D major, G minor, C minor, and D minor. And then uh, for good measure, I'll play a G7, C7, D7, and we'll see if uh, chord track can pick those all up. Let's, let's give it a shot. Okay, that's uh, three different chords uh, in three different ways. And let's just pull this down into the chord track and see what it finds. Okay, it's got G, C, D, G minor, C minor, D minor, G7, C7, D7. Um, and that's pretty accurate, I think, and I think a lot of people will find this extraordinarily useful. And you may find it useful if you want to learn songs, just dump uh, raw audio into the chord track, or if you want to know exactly what chord you're playing. Now, I will say it's not perfect, but it gets the big ones pretty well. So this is a cool new feature, audio to chord track. Number five, scale editor and vary audio. This is one of those quality of life improvements that just makes life easier for using the program. You can actually choose scales within Vary Audio and adjust your piano roll to show you exactly the correct notes of a scale. So I'll show you how this works. I'm going to jump into Cubase and just sing an approximation of a G major scale. So I'll just hit record here and let's go for this. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Okay, now we'll uh, jump into Cubase and we'll open up our very audio. And uh, I got sort of close. I got the last note right. Um, but we're here in this, like it starts in the C major scale. And with the scale note guides on, you can see that it's supposed to hit the white notes. So if it was D, this would be the, the white notes represent D major. Since I was trying to sing a G major, we can um, adjust it to... To these notes and we can quantize pitches but it'll just try to get as close as possible I sang the first note a little flat so we'll move that up and we'll tr listen to it totally quantized do re mi fa so la ti do so not terrible pretty quickly I have a pitch accurate G major scale now if you want to do this um, you could transpose it up but if you wanted to see Let's, what does an F major scale look like? Um, if you notice, if I transpose everything down a full step, all the notes will be white on the piano roll because I have the scale note guides on and then that, what I just sang, my G will be an F. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And it's not just major scales. If uh, we wanted to do G, but sort of make this a minor, it will um, give us a guide here. So we can, uh, you know, quantize back and just put everything on the white notes and we'll have G minor. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And just quick workflow tips like that, a little uh, help in very audio. I think it'll make everyone's life a little bit easier, it'll, especially for, you know, which scale you're working in. Uh, help with vocal tuning and help with anything you use very audio for.
Number six, ARA audio track integration. So I don't use a lot of ARA plugins. I think the biggest one that you would be using would be Solomone's Melodyne plugin for vocal tuning. I just use Vary Audio, which is included with Cubase. However, Cubase did think kindly enough in the last version to include an ARA plugin called Spectra Layers. So I'll show you what this audio track ARA integration looks like real quick, and it'll be very useful for you if you're a avid user of Spectra Layers, or if you use something like a Melodyne, which is probably the most famous ARA plugin that I can think of. So here on voice, if we look over here in the um, inspector panel, we see no extension. Well, if I click on this, uh, Spectra Layers is my only option because it's the only ARA plugin that we have, but it's actually, you can add Spectra Layers as an extension and there it is. Now I can view when I look, I won't be looking at the Cubase sample editor. I'll actually be looking at this with Spectra Layers. Let's take a look. Whoa, trippy bro. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm not the biggest user or most knowledgeable person there is about Spectra Layers, but you can have ARA integration or you can go to no extension and get back to the sample editor. So that ARA integration will be great if you use a lot of plugins that utilize ARA. It's uh, integrated straight on the audio track now. Number seven, the sample editor looks better. Okay, I know this one's a little bit nitpicky, but you have to look at these screens all the time. And the sample editor, I think they've made some improvements to how it looks and I like it a lot. I can just throw up a screenshot right now of what the old one looked like just so you guys can have a little bit of a comparison. And I know that this is not the most groundbreaking change of all time, but when you're looking at a DAW for several hours a day or more, having it look nice is kind of important. So I like the fact that the sample editor looks better. Number eight, export events. This is one of those features you can't believe that they didn't already have, but it's going to be useful and I'm glad that they included it. A few versions back, they included render in place. Now you can just straight up export events. So let's show you how this works. If I wanna export me singing the scale, give me fast. All I have to do is select the event, go to file, export, export selected events and it'll give me my dry channel settings, complete signal path, complete signal path plus master effects, choose whatever I want, and it will export to the um, mix down folder of wherever your project is housed. Now, that's a small thing, but it's something that needed to be in there, and I'm glad that it finally is. Export events is a thing in Cubase 12. Number nine, logical transformer and project logical improvements. Now there are a lot of tutorials out there on the Project Logical page, and I have never done one because I don't really use it. Maybe this is the year that I finally dial in my Project Logical page, but for advanced users of Cubase, I guess the Project Logical page can save you a lot of time if you implement it into your workflow. And I can show you real quickly for all MIDI tracks, the Input Transformer, um, it's available on all instrument and MIDI tracks now. So that's kind of nice if you're a big Input Transformer type of person. Number 10. Dolby Atmos support. What can I say? I don't use it, but if you use it, it's here. Dolby Atmos support is included with Cubase 12. Number 11, new piano VST. There's a new piano VST included with Halion Sonic SE. It's about an eight and a half gigabyte library and it's called Verve. Very atmospheric pianos. I'll just give you a taste of the initial patch because you're gonna have to dive into this yourself, but let's check it out. Here's the Verve page. Mm. So lots to explore there, a new piano in Cubase 12. Number 12, new plugins. So there's two new plugins included with Cubase. The first one is a compressor called Razor, and the second one is a uh, FX modulator. So you have all these effects down here, you can put whatever you want into here, and then add an effects curve to it. Sir, what he um, so lots of creative expression here. I think that people were looking for, especially an effects modulator, and there's uh, several modules you can use from within the, tr uh, the effects modulator plugin to sort of get a lot of modulation on any effect you want. And of course this Razor is a dead simple, looks like a dead simple compressor to me. I haven't had a lot of time to play around with it, but there are two new plugins in Cubase. There's also a third one called a linear dither in the mastering section, I believe. So this one is for all the mastering folks out there, a linear dithering plugin. 
And there are a few improvements to, I think, the step filter and the supervision. There's new meters and supervision. But these two new plugins, I believe, are the ones that you'll probably end up using most, FX Modulator and Razor. So there you have it, folks. 12 reasons why you should upgrade to Cubase 12. If you found this video useful, please feel free to give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content about making music, especially with Cubase Pro 12. So I'll check you guys in the next one. Peace.